vision, determination, form, purpose. When combined, these qualities create works of art, monuments, and engineering wonders. Newspaper publisher Fred Hartman had vision, vision to bridge gaps where communities are divided, vision to inspire others to work toward a common goal. When cars piled onto ferries to cross the Houston Ship Channel from Baytown to La Porte, Hartman worked to replace those ferries with a tunnel. When traffic surpassed the tunnel's capacity, Hartman envisioned a bridge to replace the tunnel. He worked with local governments and chambers of commerce, as well as the Texas Highway Commission, to build his vision over the ship channel, the bridge that would bear his name. Hartman worked with then Texas Highway Commission Chairman Bob Lanier to realize his vision. Lanier, at 15, got his first job working for Hartman, so he was quite familiar with Hartman's vision and dedication. Fred Hartman's vision for a bridge across the Houston Ship Channel gained support from citizens and industries alike. Local chemical plants and refineries employ thousands of people from all over the Houston area. Commuters must make the daily trek across the channel. Trucks and large ships use the highways and waterways to transport goods from these industries. Prohibited from using the tunnel, trucks carrying hazardous cargo must drive miles out of the way to their destination. The channel itself is too narrow and too shallow for some larger cargo ships to enter. Billions of dollars in shipments travel along the Houston Ship Channel, one of the world's busiest. Tourists come from all over Texas and the country to visit Kima, Clear Lake, and the popular beach resort at Galveston. Traffic in the narrow two-lane tunnel quickly exceeds the capacity of 25,000 vehicles per day. Long lines cause delays, accidents, and headaches for those who must take the only route available. Response time for emergency vehicles is critically slow. Texas Highway 146 connects Galveston to Interstate 10 and is used as a hurricane evacuation route. Due to the threat of flooding, the tunnel closes during the critical early stages of hurricane evacuations. The bridge is not only a vision, it is a necessity. Griner Incorporated of Tampa, Florida was commissioned for the design. Blending form, function, and aesthetic value, a bridge was born. Designers envisioned towers on either side of the ship channel that would rise the height of a 45-story building and chose a cable-stayed bridge design to accommodate the long center spans. The bridge had to be designed to resist hurricane force winds common to the Texas coast. 40 million pounds of steel, the weight of 16,000 cars would be used in the bridge. The Texas Highway Commission, with Bob Lanier as chairman, approves the bid to build the bridge. Williams Brothers and Trailer Brothers construction companies form a partnership to tackle this massive project. During a pre-construction meeting, Highway Department personnel are introduced to contractors and begin to work out the details of traffic control. It was time to move the vision into reality. Construction begins. Peninsulas are built for each footing on the approach piers. An island is created for the South Tower. 264 concrete piles sunk deep into the earth will support the towers. A combination of drilling and pile driving had to be used in order to find solid footing for the 130-foot piles. 
Epoxy-coated rebar forms the skeleton for the enormous concrete footing. The forms are ready. The material is ready. The men are ready. The concrete plant begins to produce the largest mix of concrete for a single placement that the department has ever undertaken. In a massive one-day job, about 145 truckloads of concrete were placed for the tower footing. The work started before sunrise and continued through the day to ensure the strength gained from one continuous placement. In all, almost 120,000 cubic yards of concrete will be used on the bridge. While construction continued on the towers and approaches, the strands of cable that would hold the main span had to be tested. 192 stay cables form an integral part of the bridge's superstructure. Each cable is comprised of several steel strands, ranging from 19 to 61 in number. To ensure the cables would meet the required performance demands, Four mock-ups are tested at Ferguson Structural Engineering Laboratory at the University of Texas in Austin. These strands are tested for fatigue resistance to ensure they would hold the weight of the span and the heavy traffic volume. The largest of the cables withstood a load of over three million pounds. Meanwhile, at the bridge site, work continues. Rebar cages are lifted in place to form the towers. The largest cage is 52 feet tall and fits in the center of the north tower. Placing this bow tie requires a skilled crane operator and precise directions from the supervisor. Tension builds as the mass of steel is lifted to its place in the structure. crane continues to hold the bow tie in place while workers compress the mechanical couplers to connect the two pieces. The south tower is constructed using a truss. Cranes work from the truss which is raised as the tower increases in height. On one long August day, the truss was raised more than 50 feet. The operation began early. Jacks on top of the tower pull the truss with cables. Excess cable is cut every 10 feet. Then the jacks pull some more. The truss reaches its next working position just before sundown. Workers secure the truss and the process of building the tower resumes. Cages are assembled on the ground, then lifted onto the tower and secured into place. These cages have guide pipes for stay cables to be threaded through. Concrete is placed around each rebar cage to create 
the massive towers. When working at great heights with large segments, there are bound to be snags. A tagline catches on a piece of rebar. Unfazed, a worker climbs to a dizzying height to release the rope. So high is this tower that you can see downtown Houston over 20 miles away. The final cage is placed to complete the South Tower. Flags quietly celebrate the milestone as work continues. While the towers and decks are being built, steel for the main span is being fabricated in Cape Town, South Africa. TxDOT inspectors take up residence in Cape Town to make sure the steel meets stringent specifications. When all the steel passes inspection, it is shipped to the United States. Here, the steel grids are sandblasted and painted before being used on the bridge. Using a balanced cantilever method, the contractor places each steel section into place. Huge cables attached to the tower will support the steel. Cables are bundled and encased in plastic pipe. In all, the Fred Hartman Bridge will use more than 600 miles of cable stay strand. Stretched end to end, the strands would reach from El Paso to Dallas. Once the steel sections are in place, deck panels are installed. Concrete is placed to fill the final gap in the decking. Pins, one foot in diameter and weighing about a thousand pounds each, are placed in specially fabricated steel grids at the end of the cable stayed portion of the bridge. This feature allows the bridge to expand and contract and flex under heavy traffic loads. It also provides equilibrium by countering the forces of the cables. As the main span nears completion, workers make headway on the north approach. Crews work to grade the land, place ramps, and pave the roadway that must split between Texas 146 and Loop 201. Finally, the contractor is ready to close the east side of the span. Fluctuating temperatures and the hot Texas sun cause the steel sections to expand and contract. The contractor decides to wait until the coolness of the morning to place the steel. Flags of the United States and Texas adorn the final section as it is bolted into place. Back at the concrete plant's construction yard, the final deck panels are being fabricated. Inspectors check the materials as they have done on the other 500 deck panels. Concrete samples from the panels will be tested for strength before approved for use on the bridge. Inspectors check as the last steel section closes the span. It takes skilled maneuvering to fit the section into the proper position. Workers put it around the hard way and it fits like a puzzle piece. With the last section in place, workers touch up the steel with paint. The approaches are paved. Cables are filled with grout to protect against corrosion, then wrapped with bright yellow tape to create their striking color. A four-inch layer of reinforced concrete is placed over the deck to form the driving surface of the bridge. To passers-by, the bridge looks ready. On a sunny September day in 1995, citizens, dignitaries, workers, and admirers join together for the official ribbon-cutting ceremony. Everyone is proud to take part in this historic day. Former Highway Commission Chairman Bob Lanier is now the mayor of Houston. On this day, he returns home to honor the realization of a dream of his lifelong friend. The Fred Hartman Bridge is opened for business.
Traffic now flows smoothly across the Houston Ship Channel. The wide lanes are designed to accommodate 200,000 cars per day. A far cry from the 25,000 cars that squeezed through the tunnel. Although Fred Hartman did not live to see his vision realized, his influence continues through the many lives he touched. His vision for an open connection across the ship channel will benefit people in this area for many years. Integrity, honesty, dedication, vision. These qualities describe Fred Hartman. This bridge, which bears his name, represents his legacy. It is a bridge of vision. Hartman's vision, the designer's vision, the builder's vision, and the vision of those who will use it, admire it, and even take it for granted. Now, commuters, shippers, tourists, and fishermen marvel at what was once only a vision.